What a beautiful day of sunshine. You know, spring has definitely come now. I saw buds on the, the dead looking vines. And the, uh, you know, the poppies are going wild. I love that. And uh, the rain that we have prayed for has momentarily abated. And I'm enjoying being back in the garden. And just a little note, this might not get announced at the service. There's a huge pile of dirt back here in the, um, on the back parking lot that was given to the church. And it turns out we don't need all of it. So if you are also in the garden, you might want to come and bring a bucket or two or a bag or two and help yourself. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Now, as a retired preacher, there are two Sundays, two, day, two days that I have to always reserve for being here as a uh, favor to the, my rector. And that was true, that's been, was true when I was a rector. I had a retired priest and he always came on Christmas Day and today, the second Sunday of Easter. Now, I've preached, therefore, on the second Sunday of Easter with you uh, for how many years is it now? Six? Six? At least, well, seven, because I preached this before you came, too. And I've always preached on the first part of that lesson. You know, that wonderful telling um, of the story of that first evening when the disciples are gathered together, they're terrified that they also will be crucified and they're gathered in a room and um, John tells the whole story of Easter. The resurrection, the appearance to the disciples and the giving of the Holy Spirit, the whole tamale, one night. It's wonderful, I love it. And so I always preach on that. And there's lots of ways to approach it, but I've, I have to admit I've neglected Thomas. I've neglected him because of the power of the beginning of that, of that reading. And it turns out, I, after sort of doing a little study, it turns out that not only is Thomas on all the lists of the disciples in all of the four Gospels, but he also is very important in the Gospel of John. He appears three times, not once, with speaking parts. Um, the first is when Jesus um, hears that his friend Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, has died. He decides he's going to go to Bethany. And uh, the disciples, uh, he, says, he says to the disciples that he's going to go. And, and the disciples say, don't go there. They just tried to stone you, meaning in Jerusalem. And uh, they were afraid. They didn't want to go. But Thomas speaks up. Thomas says, let us go also that we may die with him. No shrinking violence. It tells you a lot about him, I think, that he spoke up. He is devoted to Jesus, and he's not afraid of the consequences of his love, and he's also a leader to be reckoned with. Um, so it should come as no surprise when we know the history of Thomas later on. You know, he became a missionary to um, India and brought the gospel to the subcontinent of India. Um, he also uh, is connected to the gospel, the Gnostic gospel of, of Thomas, which is non-canonical, but really fascinating to read. Anyway, he was an important person to those, and leader among the disciples. And the second time he appears, is, um, or he speaks, is in John 14, when Jesus says um, that those famous words that we have been hearing a lot recently, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go 
and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place I am going. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas is a man who knows his own mind and he's not afraid to speak up. He's not afraid to look foolish, you know, to ask that what you think of it must be an obvious question that everybody should know the answer to. No, we don't know where you're going. Thomas wants to understand and so he asks. He doesn't doubt Jesus, but he needs all the guidance he can get. You know, we kind of sell him short by just calling him Doubting Thomas. He's a lot more important and I think his story is more important than that. So then let's look at today's passage. Well, obviously he's a, he's a leader among the disciples because they are very anxious to tell him that they have seen the risen Lord. And when they tell him, he is, uh, he is, he responds by some skepticism. What he can't comprehend is whether the person that they have really seen is Jesus who was crucified. It isn't that I think that he is, doesn't believe that people can be raised from the dead. That's our doubt. But his doubt was, was this man who he knew as a friend and Lord who died ignominiously on the cross, condemned and executed as a criminal, can this man be the one they have seen? His own meeting with the resurrected Christ parallels Mary Magdalene's. Both are grieving and in despair. Mary sees but does not recognize Jesus until he calls her by name. He makes the connection for her. So Thomas cannot trust the other disciples' testimony until he sees and touches the wounds of Jesus. We don't know if he actually touched them, but we do know that he saw them. Each has a need, a barrier between that seeing with the, the outer reality and recognizing the inner truth. In Thomas's case, Jesus gives him exactly what he asks for and invites him to touch his wounds. His last sight of Jesus had been on the cross. So in order for him to believe that this is Jesus, he needs to see that this is the wounded Jesus who died. Thomas's gift to us, I think, is the realization that belief comes when we can understand God's presence even in suffering and death. His death, our own death, our neighbor's death, our loved one's death. The reality of suffering and death is often a reason people give for saying, I can't believe that God is good. How could there be a good God when all this suffering and death exists? How can a good God let this happen? How fitting that in Jesus we see God's love, God's goodness, God's presence, precisely in the very suffering and death that causes us to doubt God. 
the older I get, the clearer the reality of decay and death becomes. <laughs> I was saying to Amy, I, I woke up uh, the other morning and I looked in the mirror and I thought, oh my God, my hair's completely white now. <laughs> She said, you didn't notice before? Well, no, it's that moment of recognition when you see, oh, I'm really old now. <laughs> well, not really old. I'm only 75, so that's not really old. That's middle old. <laughs> anyway, I've lived the last 18 years with my puppy dog, Nicky. He's a little Maltese. He is faithful and devoted, and he shows me each day how to age gracefully. He's mostly blind and deaf, and his walks have gotten very, very short. <laughs> he just sits down and doesn't want to go any further. But he still wants to be on my lap or at my feet and he still loves his treats, and he, and he loves to sleep, oh my gosh, he loves to sleep, on soft beds, especially my pillows, but anywhere there's a soft bed, and I have them scattered around the house, thinking he might need more than one in case he um, can't, can't find it, so. He's teaching me how to live with death at hand, Caring for him is a great blessing for me, as is caring for my father, and as was visiting Judy Cummins last Wednesday. By the way, she is, I want to say, doing well. She is doing much better on the hospice and with her brother present and helping her anyway. She sends her greetings and thanks you for your love and your prayers, which she says are very precious. The nuisances or of old age, the limitations and disabilities, the frailties of our bodies, even death, are part of this life abundant that we are promised in the gospel. Our lives are transformed by Christ's presence so that we can see past the surface of what we don't like into the reality of who we are. which is gifted with life, life abundant. Richard Rohr begins his uh, marvelous little book called The Universal Christ, which I recommend very highly. It's, it's, it's as, as, a, as a friend of mine who's fairly conservative um, evangelical said, uh, well, it's certainly close to heresy. <laughs> Uh, but for me, it, it really opens up the gospel in a way that makes it more uh, available to all people. So you're not always worried, you know, if, if I, um, am I right and everybody else is wrong? Well, no, everybody else isn't wrong. Everybody else is beloved too. Anyway, the universal Christ, he begins that book with a, with, um, a story from the experience of Carol Hauslander, who is um, an English, 20th century English mystic, a woman uh, who tells her uh, story, a Catholic woman who tells her story, um, the story of her life in a book called The uh, Rocking Horse Christian. Anyway, this story, this is a story of what happened to her one day as she rode the London tube. She says, I was in the underground train in which all sorts of people jostled together, sitting and strap hanging, workers of every description going home at the end of the day. Quite suddenly, I saw with my mind, but as vividly as a wonderful picture, Christ in them all. 
But I saw more than that. Not only was Christ in every one of them, living in them, dying in them, rejoicing in them, sorrowing in them, but because he was in them, and because they were here, the whole world was here too, here in this underground train. I came out into the street and walked for a long time in the crowds. It was the same here on every side in every passerby, everywhere, Christ. After a few days, the vision faded. People looked the same again and there was no longer that, that shock of insight each time I was face to face with another human being. Christ was hidden again. Indeed, through the years to come, I would have to seek for him, and usually I would find him in others and still more in myself, only through a deliberate, blind act of faith. Friends, trust Jesus when he tells you, do not doubt, but believe. And hear Jesus' blessing on all of us who do not see, but are enabled to believe. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Lord is risen. Hallelujah.